Uh, from the verses today, I, I want to preach on, on this thought. If you're, if you're looking for a title, it would be Rich Responsibility. Rich Responsibility. And so let's begin reading verse number 17 together. The Bible says, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. This is the reading of God's holy word. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you for allowing us to be here. And we, we would pray this morning along with the psalmist, open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of your law. God, teach us this morning by your spirit, your word. And I pray that you would change us this morning in this setting. May we, may we not be here just to fill another void of time in our life. May we not be here just to put a check mark beside a religious duty. But God, may we be here today to interact with you through your word. And so may you speak to us. Would you, would you just not shake, shake the earth and not just heaven, but shake our hearts this morning. Change us from the inside out, from glory as unto glory. May, may none of us that are here today leave the same way we came. So bless us now, Father, as our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Well, Christianity can be summed up, I believe, in one word. And that one word would be the word stewardship. Stewardship refers to this, this idea that someone owns something and they have placed what they own into my possession for me to either keep it safe or to advance a profit from it. And so stewardship in, in those terms, someone, someone owns something and they give to me what they own. They, they remain the owner of that thing, but they have trusted it into my possession. Christian stewardship then is a recognition that all that you and I possess has been given to us by God, that we own virtually nothing in this world, that even our very life is not our own. We have been bought with a price, and we are therefore to glorify God in our body and in our spirit, and both of them, Paul says, belong to God. So how well you and I actually live the Christian life is determined and will be determined by how well we have used what God has entrusted to us. We are stewards, Peter says, of the manifold grace of God. God has distributed to every man severally as His ability. He has given to us various resources, time, talents, everything that you and I possess. Even, even our children, the Bible says, are a heritage from the Lord. And so everything we, we have been given, we are to be good stewards. That is, we are to be good benefactors of all that God has blessed us with. A man by the name of Patrick Fairbairn, uh, who was a minister in the Free Church of Scotland during the 19th century in, in commenting on individuals who had become converted to Christ, who had correspondingly become members of a local church and these convert these converts to Christianity uh, were wealthy individuals. They had access to great wealth and means of life. Patrick Fairbairn said, having acquired riches, still retain their Christianity and are willing to use what they possess in accordance with the truth of God. And I believe this, in a nutshell, sums up exactly what Paul is writing to us here in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verses 17, 18, and 19. That you and I have come to Christ, and in coming to Christ, we still have within our possession, within our grasp, some of us more than others, great wealth, 
and resources, talents and potential. And you and I are to use what we possess in accordance with the truth of God. Well, I believe there's a misnomer that needs to be corrected in our day. And that's probably the understatement of the year uh, with all of the uh, misnomers and misunderstandings that are associated with 21st century Americanized Christianity. Uh, but one of those misconceptions is that in modern times, in, inside of the umbrella or up underneath the umbrella of Christianity, there has been made a distinction between what is considered to be worship and what is considered to be service. And the vast majority of those professing faith in Christ would consider themselves to worship on occasion, but to rarely, definitively ever serve God. Well, this isn't right. Instead of a distinction being made between what is worship and what is service, there ought to be a connection made between the two. And the connection would sound something like this, that you are not worshiping God unless you are actually serving God. And those two concepts of worship and serve are actually connected for us in the pages of God's holy word. In fact, in Matthew chapter number 4, you'll remember as Jesus has fasted, 40 days and 40 nights, and he goes into the wilderness and he is tempted of the devil. That, that in one of the temptations that, that Christ faces of the devil there in Matthew chapter 4 and verse number 10, Jesus' response to Satan sounds something like this. Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, and he is now going to quote from the book of Deuteronomy. And, and Jesus says to Satan, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. And the two terms, worship and serve, could be used interchangeably. In fact, they are related terms. And so, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, or thou shalt serve the Lord thy God. And Him only shalt thou worship, or Him only shalt thou serve. Because to worship something is to serve something. And to serve something is to worship. And so, if there is no service rendered to God, you can very well say that you have never worshipped God. And by the way, Christian worship isn't defined by coming in and sitting down on a padded pew and watching a man perform for 45 minutes to an hour. Christian service, Christian worship is the laying down of my life at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ Himself for Him to use me as He deems best. Well, from our passage of Scripture this morning, I believe we could correctly understand that unless you and I are willing to use what God has lent to us, then we are not worshiping Him. Unless we are using the resources that God has entrusted to us. By the way, He did not give to us those resources for us to merely dig a hole in the earth and bury them in it. Or to find a, uh, a, uh, a some, some sort of a uh, security box at a bank and hide them in it. God has not intended to, to give to us in our possession what we could just lay up in store and watch it get larger and larger and larger. On the contrary, you and I have been called to utilize everything that God has placed within our grasp. And if we do not do that, we would be guilty of the sin of idolatry because we would just be heaping to ourselves what we really would be worshiping at that point. And that would be riches. Our text this morning, beginning inside of verse number 17, is postmarked to them that are rich. And so obviously, as Paul is writing to, to Pastor Timothy, who is the pastor of the local church inside of the city of Ephesus, we are at once confronted with this idea that inside of the church of, of Ephesus were some members who had means. In other words, there were some people inside of the church at Ephesus that were well off. I mean, they had, they had a, a great substance. They, they were, they were rich in certain terms. Now, now, if we were to compare the church at Ephesus to the church at Corinth, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 26, we find out that inside of the church at Corinth, there weren't a lot of rich people, if you were. There weren't a lot of noble. There weren't a lot of mighty individuals in that church. But in contradistinction to that, the church in Ephesus seems to be permeated with individuals who have a very well off life. To live. And so immediately, you and I are thinking, wow, that would be awesome to be a person who's rich. And yet, the word rich is a very 
relative term. You know, to, uh, to a lot of people in this world, you and I are rich. If, if you and I live on the side of the street somewhere, then to a lot of people inside of this world that you and I live in, we would still be very rich people. It's a very relative term, and it's relative in this sense, that no one thinks that they are rich, but everyone thinks that someone else is rich. <laughs> Isn't that an interesting concept? None of us would ever think that we are rich individuals. I mean, I mean, we're money hungry. I mean, we're grabbing everything that we can get. None of us thinks that we are rich, but every one of us presumably thinks that we know someone else who is rich. Paul here tells the pastor of the church in Ephesus what kind of instructions he is to give to those who are a part of the membership of his church that have some semblance of wealth associated with them. And so he's going to give this instruction really under three headings this morning. We're going to look at it, uh, uh, the instruction Paul gives to Timothy to give to the membership of his tr- uh, the membership of his church concerns what they were to resist, what they were required, and what would be their reward. And so from verse number 17, we're going to notice, first of all this morning, the resistance of the rich. Very rich responsibility this morning. The, the rich uh, in the church at Ephesus, the rich in every church, the rich in Fellowship Baptist Church need to understand that there is to be some sort of a resistance. There is, there is, there's to be some sort of a restraint, a discipline in, in, in a person's life that has some sense of accumulated wealth to where they just don't live a loose life of everything is, is, is permissible to them. So notice it with me, verse number 17, and this, this just breaks down perfectly for us into the three headings that we have. Verse number 17 uh, shows us the resistance of the rich. And so Paul writes, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the positive they are to trust in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. And so the first responsibility that we have with our possessions, Paul says, is to put up a resistance, if you will, a restraint. And there are certain qualities, if you will, that are associated with riches in this world. There are certain bad qualities, uh, uh, evil tendencies, if you will, that attach themselves to wealth of any kind. And so Paul says, with the accumulation of wealth, you need to know that there are some places that are, that are, uh, that are out of bounds. There are some off-limit areas. There, there is some resistance that you will need to put into place as you accumulate great wealth to yourself. And, and, and really the, the proverbial statement here, I believe, attached to this would simply be that the more wealth a person has, the more resistance that person is going to have to exert against such evil tendencies. The more you accumulate to yourself the more you are going to have to guard yourself from allowing those bad qualities to bleed through in your life. And so to begin with, we are told as far as the resistance of the rich, we are told that we are to resist arrogancy. Notice it with me again inside of verse number 17. It is noted by the term high-minded. Paul says, charge them. Again, very serious language. Charge them that are rich in this world, first of all, that they be not high-minded. And to be high-minded means to be lofty in mind. It means to be arrogant or to be prideful. It means to have an exalted opinion of oneself. It means to think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. It it refers to a a person who is high-minded is someone who is constantly looking down at others who do not possess what they have. And so they have some sense of superiority about them. Like they've arrived while others are still trying to get to their level. And so Paul says, do not be high-minded. So do not be high-minded. Do not be lofty in mind. Do not have an exalted opinion of yourself. Do not look down upon others. So so what is the characteristic? Uh, what, what, what should the characteristic of a rich person or really in general of all Christianity be? And the very opposite of high-mindedness then would be a state of Humility. Believers are to remain humble in mind. And, and may I remind us this morning that we have the greatest example of humility found in the person of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In fact, would you listen to, to His humility 
in Philippians chapter 2, and I'm beginning in verse number 3, Paul writes to the church at Philippi, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You know, we're talking about the life of Jesus Christ. We're not talking about uh, Jesus being dealt with according to as he deserved to be dealt with. Now, when we're talking about the life of Jesus Christ, we're talking about a life of humility where He steps in and willingly takes what He has never nor never would deserve. And so you and I are to put up a resistance against arrogancy. We are never to assume that we are better than anyone, but in contradistinction to that, we are to be very humble-minded individuals. Well, Paul also tells us as far as the resistance of the rich is concerned, we are told to resist trusting in uncertain riches. That, that they were nor to trust in uncertain riches. And the verb trust here, el piso in the Greek, means to expect, it means to confide, or it means to even to hope in. Uh, uh, these individuals who have some wealth, they, they were not to pillow their head down at night and sleep comfortably because they have a larger bank account than some other folks. That They were not to find their confidence in life by the fact that they have a successful career, a good paying job, and that they have an outstanding 401k plan. That, that wasn't to be the source of their expectancy. This wasn't to be uh, their, their, their hope or their confidence. In fact, listen to, to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 4 and 5 speaks to the same end. And the writer of, of, of Proverbs says, Labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. And so in the writer there of, of, of Proverbs, Solomon himself says, labor not to be rich. He says, he is saying, don't put your confidence in riches. Don't, don't set that as the number one priority of your life because, uh, and, and the proverb goes, to, uh, goes without saying here, but I'm going to say it anyway because I'm a Baptist preacher. <laughs> easy come, easy go. And what you have found to be your source of confidence in one fell swoop with one diagnosis. It can all just vanish away. And by the way, what, what good would it be to have all the wealth in all the world and for you to maintain it until the point that you die and you enter into eternity? And then what do you have to look forward to? Because riches do not profit, the Bible says, in the day of wrath. And so Paul is telling Timothy here in 1 Timothy chapter number 6, do not build your expectations of life on the size of your bank account. Do not trust in your money. Do not trust in your retirement. Do not trust in your talents. Do not trust in your government. The horse is prepared unto battle, but safety is of the Lord. You need to put your confidence in God, which is where he, he ends up here. Verse 17, again, do not be high-minded. Do not trust in uncertain riches. But here's the positive command. You do need to trust in the living God. Put your singleness of trust in God Himself, in the living God, to, to separate Him from all other false deities. In the, in the city of Ephesus, there were so many pagan deities. There was, there was so much false, uh, or false worship and, and idolatrous worship that was going on. And so Paul here makes a distinction. Put your trust in the living God. But I believe there's a more practical way of seeing that. Uh, so many people, their money is their God. And it's a dead God. For some people, their health is their God. And it's a death, it's a, it's a dead God. Uh, for some people, athleticism. And, and, and we worship, listen, whatever you're serving, that is whatever you're going after in life, that is what you are worshiping. And so Paul says, get your priorities right and, and you need to trust, you need to serve, and you need to worship the living God. And there's only one of them. And his name is Jehovah. So instead, you need to trust the living God, who, who, by the way, Paul says in verse number 17, richly gives to us 
all things. God is the God who richly gives all things because He is the possessor of all things. With Him is all things. He has created all things and by Him all things consist. God is the God who owns everything. And so if you're going to trust in anything, how about not trust, how how about trusting in the one who owns it all? Again, listen to David, Psalm 50 and verses 10 through 12. Uh, speaking on behalf of God, for every beast of the forest, God says, is mine. And the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains and the wild beast of the field are mine. If I were hungry, God says, I would not tell thee. For the world is mine and the fullness thereof. And so don't trust in your job, Paul says. Don't trust in your bank account. Don't trust in your retirement. Don't don't trust in the government. Don't trust in welfare. Don't put your trust in any of those things, but rather put your trust in God. And so the response of the believer at this point is to be one of gratitude as opposed to arrogance. we We should give God our gratitude, our thankfulness for what God and how God has blessed us instead of puffing up our chest. And saying, look at me and look how superior I am to you. And and by the way, before we move on, verse 17, He has richly given to us all things, I I love this, to enjoy. This speaks against an ascetic life. You you know, at the the formation of the early church and, and really the first several years of church history, there was this there was this Gnostic idea that arose inside of the, the large or church world scenario where people began to associate um, torturing almost themselves with godliness. And it was the idea that, that the more I, I, I prevented myself from pleasure, the more godly of a person I really become. And, and so it, it bled over into asceticism, it bled over into monasticism where you have, or you have folks going out living as hermits. I mean, they're living as, as, as just recluses of society. They are as far away and, and they thought, man, if we can just live in the desert away from all the luxuries, away from all interaction, if we can just prevent ourselves from any social reaction or, 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 or um, uh, attachment, that, that if we can just kind of, kind of put ourselves through a lot of torture in life, that means that we're going to get a whole lot closer to God. Well, here we find the very opposite of that is true. That God has rather given to us what He has given to us for us to enjoy. But for us to enjoy in the sense that we hold it, and we'll see this coming up this morning, but we hold it with a very loose hand. Because God has not... What God has given to us, we are not the final destination of what God has trusted us with. But we are to be channels where, where God is just using us as, as a step along the way to fuel whatever it is that God has in mind. And so, and so we could ask ourselves some questions here. Do, do we flaunt our wealth with the intention of putting others down? I mean, do we just love to just show how much more superior than others that we really are? Uh, we should, we should read verse number 17 and make a decision this morning that we need to be very careful in our communication so that we don't come across very arrogantly. And I think that's a tendency for all of us sometimes, you know, that, that depending or, or, or really not depending on our economic status. If we just find that we've got to edge up on someone, and, and we may not even mean to, but we'll say some very demeaning things to people sometimes. I mean, out of our mouth goes, and, and once it goes, it is there, and there is no retracting it. And if we're not careful, I mean, we'll, I, I was thinking about cell phones, you know. Now, some folks just live... For, for cell phones. I mean, like, like a new iPhone. Oh yeah, I'm preaching at y'all this morning. That's right. And the new iPhone, and, and, and you see it on the, on the news. I mean, I mean, if there's a lot of updates, I mean, people will go and they'll, they'll, they'll camp out on the street. They'll, they'll put their tent up and they'll be, they'll be lined up down. I mean, I mean, they just live for that thing. And so they get it. And now the camera, yeah, you remember went from one, one, uh, the phone went from one camera to having two camera lenses. And then, and then some of y'all's got the, you got the phone that has the three camera lenses. And, and you remember it used to be that you wanted the smallest phone. And then it went to wanting the largest phone. And, and you, I mean, I mean, I thought about going back in my mom's closet and getting her bag phone out. And just be like, hey, yeah, what's up now? You know, kind of thing. And so, but, but, but whenever we get kind of the newest gadget, 
We'll, we'll look at somebody else and say, oh, you still got a flip phone? <laughs> oh, oh, your phone doesn't do that? Don't say that to me after church, okay? <laughs> you know? But, but if we're not careful, we'll have that kind of language. that comes, and, and we're not meaning to. But we need to guard against that. We should not derive our confidence from the balance of our checkbook. We should make God the source of our confidence. Well, there's a second thing as far as rich responsibility is concerned. And we find this in verse number 18, and it is the requirement of the rich. What is it proactively that God legitimately requires of those who have attained wealth? Read it with me, verse 18. That they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. And so in stewardship, there are not only things that we do not need to do, but there are equally things that we need to make sure that we are getting accomplished. And so what we hold in our hands uh, does not belong to us. We need to realize that. We need to recognize that. That we are only trusted with what really belongs to God at the end of the day. And so God, as the true owner of all things, has set some rules for you and I to operate by as good stewards of His manifold grace. And rule number one, Requirement number one, if you will, is that we are to be good. Or if you will, we are to do good. you got to work with me on my outline here. I had to stay with the three Bs. This is like a Warren Wearsby outline. Some of you that are are read know that Warren Wearsby has that B series. And every book in the New Testament is B this and B that. And so so I'm following Warren Wearsby's outline here, okay? And so we need to be good. That is, we need to do good. Verse 18, that they do good. And the word good here refers to what is excellent in nature. It is what is intrinsically good. And so the idea, uh, verse number 18, of us doing good is to do what does not have to be justified or excused away. You know, a lot of times when we're making decisions in life, we're making those decisions based upon the justifications that we've had to make. And we're trying to excuse our our way of thinking just to kind of help us be able to fall asleep at night time. Paul is saying here, while we may all be called upon that to do at some points in time, in regards to the possessions that God has placed within our grasp, Paul says here that we are to do what we would not have to justify doing. It is just something that is understandably good. We are to do good unto all men, the Bible says, especially them that be of the household of faith. Again, I want to, I want to kind of draw us back to the words of wisdom of Solomon in Proverbs chapter three and verses 27 and verse number 28. Paul says, withhold not good from them to whom it is due when it is in the, in, in thy power, in the power of thine hand to do it. Say not unto thy neighbor, go and come again, and tomorrow I will give it when thou hast it by thee today. Do good. I mean, I mean, use what God has put within your own grasp in certain regards to be a blessing to others, to be a channel. And listen, all of your wealth isn't to go to people maybe who are less fortunate during a season of life, but certainly some of it would be intended for that. And there would be different venues and there would be different areas. And so it's just being a vessel, a vessel ready to be used by God. It's to pray the prayer of Isaiah. Here, my Lord, send me. Here's my life. Here's, here's everything I have. And I lay it down. I have a great example of this would be, would be the early church in the book of Acts. And, and they say, they saw themselves as having all things in common with one another. So much so that they, they, they took what they could afford. And they brought it and they laid it down at the apostles' feet. And they said, you make the decision and distribute it however you see fit. Without a business meeting. Without a deacon's meeting. Without a church council meeting. They just laid it down and said, we just want God to use what He has entrusted into our care. And so, and so be good. And then number two, watch it, be rich. In verse number 18, that they do good and that they be rich in good works. And the expression be rich here means that we are not to just do the occasional good works, but we are to be rich in good works. Good good works are to characterize who we are. We're we're not to just be like, oh wow, I I, I did something last month, (laughs) or I did something last year, or or, or I gave gave a a tithe one time, you know, when I first got saved. Or I I remember I used to support worldwide missions. Or I, I, I used to help folks. No. 
No, no, this is the idea of being rich in good works, of, of, of kind of the, the, the cup is in the saucer and the, and the cup is now filled to the brim and it's overflowing to the saucer. Okay? It's to be rich in good works. And, and by the way, there is a, there is a difference here that Paul is making between what it really means to be rich versus being kind of, kind of pretending to be rich. And, and the difference is the person who is pretending to be rich is the person who just works and labors and he, and he, and he gets all this money and he just puts it all up or he spends it all on himself. That's, that's fake riches. That's, that's pretending to be rich. Here's how I know that. You're not really rich because when you die, that's it for your riches. That's fake riches. But the person, Paul says, who is genuinely rich is a person whom God knows that He can give those resources to. And that person is going to take and use them. He is going to reinvest them in the kingdom of God. And so, and so He is taking what God has entrusted Him with and He is using it. And, and by the way, when that person dies, His riches don't die with Him. Because they have been invested into the work of God into eternity. And so be good, be rich. Number three, be generous. Be generous. That they do good, that they be rich in good works. And, and notice these next two expressions. Ready to distribute, willing to communicate. <laughs> so be a generous person. Be ready to distribute. Be, be, be willing to communicate. In other words, God does not intend for riches to be hoarded, but He intends for them to be invested. And, and again, by the expression be rich here means giving away what you have gained. Not, not holding it with such a tight hand as to just, just to be able to, to brag about what I've been given and what I'm able to do and what kind of lifestyle I have. I love Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verse number one. Cast your bread upon the water and it'll return to you not many days. Uh, the idea is, is you just take some loaf bread and you throw it in the Noose River. And it's going to get gobbled up by a massive catfish, right? Yeah. And so, and so you just take some bread and you throw it in the river and, and the natural course would be that the river is going to take it downstream. And if it's not consumed and if it all doesn't dissolve, that eventually it's going to, it's going to be out in the ocean somewhere. But God says, no, no, I have, I have superseded a natural law in the sense that when you give, I want to make sure that it circles back around to you. You ever, you ever seen that? You ever been fishing? On the river, just or just kind of you know walking by the river, and uh, and, and the current just kind of does this this crazy thing where kind of you know you can throw a bobber out there fishing, and instead of it just kind of going downstream, it hit one of those little currents, and it actually turned it, and make it go kind of back upstream. I believe that's the imagery of Ecclesiastes chapter eleven. God says, "I want to make sure that you don't give in vain." Hey, listen, let, let me just insert something here. This is supernatural living. This is. This is Bible living. This, this goes against the grain of the flesh. This goes against sight. This is, this is kind of like 2 Corinthians 5, 7, that we walk by faith and not by sight. And so we are to be generous. We are to be constantly investing what God has put into our grasp. And these two expressions really highlight that. Number one, we are to be ready to distribute. And, and the idea of being ready to distribute means I live in a state of existence where I live to give. That is my state of existence. I do not live to hoard. I do not live to just simply keep. I do not live to just revel in it. I, I don't, I don't live to just wallow around uh, in my, in my wealth. No, no, I live. My state of existence is that I live to give. I am ready to distribute. It, it's the same word that Jesus used. A, a man putting his hand to the plow and looking back. And if he looks back, he is not fit for the kingdom of God. He is not ready to be used. As long as you're looking back at the world and this attachment to the world, you're not ready to be used by God. You're too, you're too interested in popularity. You're too interested in, in prestige and, and pleasure and parties and all of that kind of stuff. And so you're not ready. You're not fit. No, no, Paul says, Paul says you are to be fit to distribute. You are to be in a state of existence where you just live to serve others. It seems like there's somebody else in the Bible that I'm thinking of that lived his life kind of like that. Ready to distribute. Notice the second expression there. Willing to communicate. And the word willing, that, that would be what you need to take like your red pen and just kind of like borrow your neighbors and just kind of bear down on that word willing. 
Okay? Because it's, it's not grudgingly. Second Corinthians chapter 9. We're, we're not talking about of necessity. It's not, it's not, oh man, preacher's taking up another offering. Stink. You know? I mean, how much more does this guy want? You know? Ah, oh, man, we gotta give and, I mean, we got a building fund and we got a, I mean, we, we got a missions account and, and I mean, there's general operations and all this evangelism and mail outs and tracks and postage and envelopes and banners and signs and, I mean, just, man. No, 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 no. No, if that's your mentality, listen, I'm not, I'm not telling you to give against your will. What Paul is saying is fix your will. If you're not willing to communicate, if you're not willing to be a channel, there's something severely wrong with your version of Christianity. Willing to communicate. By, by the way, God has always used the willingness of God's people to fuel His kingdom enterprises. Always. Brother Mason read this morning an amazing text, First Chronicles chapter 29, that highlights the giving of people... When people were found with precious stones, precious jewels, you know what they did? They said, oh yeah, yeah, you can have those for the building of the temple. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah, you need, you need these, you need my lumber. You need, you need all these acres of timber cut down, hewn down. You need them planed out. Oh yeah, man, wow, we'd love to do that. Uh, yeah, yeah, you, you, oh, you need the gold. You need the silver. What? You need the brass. I, I, oh yeah, yeah, I, I've got it. It's, like God's, God's lent it to me, but sure, you can, you can have that if that's going to help the cause of God. I'd love to give what God has blessed me with. Willing to communicate. You know, the Apostle Paul, you just jot down, maybe if you're taking notes, Romans chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Paul was able to, I mean, greatest grace preacher to live. I mean, here's, here's the preacher of preachers as far as just strict humanity is concerned. I mean, he is God's man. He accomplished so much. How was Paul able to accomplish everything that he did? In Romans chapter 16, verse 1 and 2, we find out that there was a group of women who were well off, who were, for lack of better expression, were just writing Paul checks to keep him going. We talk about the bivocational ministry of the Apostle Paul. But as his ministry continued, he did less and less and less of bivocational ministry because he needed to be more focused on doing everything. You, he couldn't make tents and be under house arrest at the same time. It didn't work. Okay? And so there was a group of ladies who just got together and said, Oh yeah, well if, if that's what God needs us to just fund. And, and, and by the way, if you, if you want a better example of that, you, you could go to Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, and you'll find that the Lord Jesus Christ Himself was funded by the resources of some ladies that He had ministered to. They were ready to distribute, and they were willing to communicate. It means to be inclined to share one's possessions. This isn't cold reluctance. This is warm compassion. This is keeping myself in a mindset of generosity. What has God given to me that I can invest into ministry for Him? And so again, I'm asking myself questions. Is there a need in someone else's life that God has given to me the means of meeting that need? Is there a ministry that I could perform that, that maybe I've been holding out on? And by the way, the, when I talk about resources and wealth, I'm not just talking about cold hard cash. Okay? I'm not just talking about what you've got in your bank account. I'm talking about your abilities and your talents and, and the help that you have and what you're able to do versus what you're not to do. And so what ministry could you be involved in? Could you work in the nursery? Could you help out with yard maintenance? Could you press or wash the building? Could you paint up some doors? Uh, could you go visit some that are, that are sick or struggling? Could you offer a prayer for someone? Could you come up to someone and say, hey, I just want to pray with you that God, God would bless you. What could you be doing that you're not doing? What has God put in your hand that you're just being a stingy tightwad with? How much of your money? Let's talk about the cold hard cash. Are you planning on taking with you when you die? Because if it's in your bank account, I promise you, it will not transfer. 
But number three, let's, let's, let's look at this last one together this morning, the reward of the rich from verse number 19. Paul says, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. And so we have seen that the rich have a responsibility to resist evil tendencies that come from the ownership of possessions. We've also seen that, that the rich have a responsibility to do good and to be generous, to be rich in good works. And so here in verse number 19, we want to see what the result from such a responsibility actually, uh, actually occurs. What, what is the reward of living a life of Christian generosity? And so Paul is going to mention really two primary things in verse number 19. And the first one has to do with appropriation. Verse number 19, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation. Laying up in store. Those who are not stingy with what they have gained, but instead they are, they are generous in the sense that they have become channels. And by channel, what, what we mean is that if there was a, a, a pool of water on a mountain slope somewhere, and, and, and there's an ocean, you know, miles and miles away, the channel would be the, the river channel that goes from the, 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 the pool of water on the mountain slope that leads all the way to the, to the river. You're just a channel of getting water from one destination to another destination, from one location to another location. And, and when God's people are not stingy people, we become channels of, of, of God moving His resources from one location to another location. And by the way, that's what you and I exist for. It's to be channels of blessings. And so these people are actually placing what they, what their hands have touched into the bank vault of heaven. They're laying up in store. Here, here's what it sounds like from, from the lips of Christ in Matthew chapter number six and verses 19 through verse number 21. Jesus says, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so Christian living has a, a ring of a dichotomy about it. Now, almost, almost a paradox about it. Let me see if I can highlight the paradox for you, okay? What God's Word is teaching us is that by giving, I'm actually keeping. By spending, I'm actually investing. Or, or if you will, just a little bit different, I am adding by subtracting. I am, I am laying up instead of in earth. I am laying up in heaven. By the, by the way, Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together, and running over. Sounds like a pretty good investment. Verse number 19, laying up in store for themselves, I love this expression, good foundation. A substruction. A, 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 a level of stability. This is not building on the sand. This is building on a rock. This is not building what's just going to last for time and then vanish away or be blown away or be judged away. This is building on a rock that's going to last. And so when the winds blow and the rain comes down, it's going to stand the test of time because we're talking about an investment that is founded upon the rock. This is, this is something solid to stand on, a good foundation. And so by investing, by laying up in store, by being a channel of blessing and God, God dispensing into my life for me to dispense elsewhere, I am, I am creating a solid or a good foundation. MP Horbin said, I love this, and I quote, Sunday all that we will have is what we have given to God. I wonder what we'll have then. Yeah. A good, a good foundation. We, we, we might say it like this, a good start. You know, um, it's, it's rough getting started in life. It, you, you remember when, when, when you first got married? I'm going to stop talking to you kids for a second, okay? I'm talking to some of us adults. You remember when you first got married? Man, it stinks getting married, don't it? <laughs> Financially. I mean, it stinks. I mean, you have no money for nothing. And, I mean, we've been married... 
We've been married a good little while. I'm not going to put a number on it publicly because if I get it wrong, that's terrible. <laughs> We've been married almost two decades. That's a general term. It can be plus or minus with that. <laughs> and um, and we're still broke. <laughs> I'm here just saying, man, I need y'all to make an investment. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, you know, you get married, and I mean, you don't have anything. And I mean, the bills are coming due, and... And, and then, and then you find out, you know, you're going to have a kid and who can afford a kid? I hear people say all the time, well, well, we're going to, we're going to wait, you know, till we can afford kids. You're, you're, what you're telling me is you're never going to have a kid. You can't afford. Can I get a witness? <laughs> you know, <laughs> goodness gracious. So, so, so we've made some decisions, my wife and myself. You know, we, we, we wanted to try and, and be, be, be real kind to our kids and, and help give them a great foundation. And so several years ago, you know, we open them up this account and, and we've been putting my hard earned money, our hard earned, earned money, 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 money into this account for them to just spend one day, I guess, without any kind of care in the world, you know. But our, our, our hope here, our hope here is that we are teaching them about the importance of money. In fact, in fact, we, we set a rule. This has been a long time ago that whatever money they get in, birthday and Christmas and all that kind of stuff, we make them half it right into to begin with. And 50% of what they have goes into this savings account, and they can't touch it. And so it goes into this savings account. They have the other 50%, and they, they give a, a percentage of that to the Lord's work, and whatever's left out of that is money that they can spend however they want to as long as they buy me a Christmas present at the end of the year. That's all That's all Daddy cares about, okay? All right? And so, again, what, what we're trying to do is give them a good foundation. We want them to have an awesome start in life by, by understanding if I invest now, then I have later. What Paul is saying for us is this, is based on the same premise. By investing now, we have later. And there's going to be a lot of folks that failed to invest now and could have invested maybe so much more than you and I could have invested Yet one day they're going to have absolutely nothing because it just all disappeared. I would say if there's a possibility of actually being broke in heaven, I know several who are going to be begging beside the street of gold because they have failed to utilize the gifts that God has entrusted to them. They have not appropriated the funds. Notice this last thing this morning. There's also an apprehension. Verse number 19. They are laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they, watch this, that they may lay hold on eternal life. And that expression there doesn't mean that they are buying their access into heaven. It's not like some, somebody's out, you know, scalping off tickets to heaven, you know, like, hey man, if you give me a, you give me a hundred dollar bill, I'll get you in, you know, into the big house, you know, kind of thing. Okay. This isn't scalp tickets here. This isn't, this isn't buying your way. This isn't if you tithe for, for five years, you know, uh, 10% of your income, you're guaranteed access into heaven. No, no, this isn't buying your way into heaven. It isn't apprehension in the sense of acquiring eternal life. No, this is apprehension in the sense of, oh, I get what eternal life is all about. Because when you, when you cross that threshold, uh, from being stingy and wanting to hold on to everything, because because I'm always worried that World War III is going to happen. I'm always worried about the next upcoming recession or, 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 or whatever's going to happen and, and, and the economy crash and the stock markets, you know, just kind of plummet to an all time low. And I'm always living fearful of this. And because I'm always living fearful of this, I have absolutely nothing in the bank vault of heaven. Uh, again, can I just, I mean, can I just stop and just insert here? Uh, just very practical how you can figure out if you're, a stingy Christian. I mean, there's a lot of ways, but, but let, let me give you one that you may not think of. If you have to figure out what you are supposed to give God with a calculator, yeah. you're probably just given by the law. Amen. Yeah. I mean, if you've got to write out the cent on the check, I know. I don't see it, by the way. Okay? And so this is just stuff Miss Eloise has told me about. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I, I don't know it. And so you bowing your head is just a telltale sign at this point. Okay. I'm taking, I'm taking mental notes at this point. Yeah. No, if this, if, if that's all given is, is to get God off my back, you don't get eternal life. 
It, it hasn't dawned on you yet what Christian living is really all about. So lay hold on eternal life. That they, in fact, the expression that they may lay hold on is one compound word, and it means to seize or to, to catch. Well, we would say it like this in our modern vernacular. You're picking up what I'm putting down. You're getting it. You're laying hold on it. You're getting a grip on it. You've got it. By investing in the kingdom of God, I am tightening my grip on what eternal life living is all about. And it's all about eternity, not right now. It's not what I have right now. It's not me fitting in or keeping up with the Joneses. It's in, It's all about me simply being used by God Himself in the eternal work of God. And so let me be very frank with us this morning. Some folks don't get it. And I would say the vast majority of people don't get it. Ironically, it seems like newer Christians get it. And older Christians have justified why they need to be stingy with what God's given to them. And never invest it. So let me ask us a question this morning. How faithful are you in stewardship? How faithful are we in stewardship? What, what words would better describe us? Okay? Would, would, would words like generous, giving, or sacrificing, would that describe our Christian experience? Or would words like stingy, tightwad, or, 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 or what about this one? Reluctant. Would that better characterize us? There's a story that's told of a beggar who asked a gift from one who appeared to be a wealthy lady. She gave him a coin saying, this is more than God has ever given to me. Oh lady, said the beggar, everything you have has been bestowed to you by the Lord. True, said the lady, but God has not given it to me. It remained His all the time. He only loaned it to me to distribute to others. I wonder if that represents our vantage point of eternal living for Christ. John Wesley said, when a man becomes a Christian, he becomes industrious, trustworthy, and prosperous. Now, if that man, when he gets all he can and saves all he can, does not give all he can, I have more hope for Judas Iscariot than for that man. May God help us to understand our rich responsibility of being Christians. Let's stand this morning for prayer.